Amen. Praise God. I can tell you what it is. I can tell you exactly what that is, but you're going to have to give my wife about 10 or 15 minutes to tell you what it is about me, what that it factor is. I haven't quite figured out what it is yet, but I can tell you what I do appreciate is what Brother Gaddy just talked about a second ago, and that is friendship. Amen. And I'm going to have you just remain standing just for a second, and we'll be seated after we go into the word of the Lord. But I I think it would be, um, it just would be inappropriate if I didn't say my appreciation to this great church. You don't realize what you mean to a church planter. We follow the same uh, historical steps started from a burning desire, and to see what new life is now gives me hope. It does. It gives me hope. And so you don't realize that you, I may never rub shoulders with you or understand your, uh, your ancestry, but I can tell you that to me and to my wife and to my family and to the church that God has allowed us to serve, you have the it factor. There are days in which I absolutely despise Twitter. And it usually ends on a rough Sunday afternoon that I can hardly bring myself to see what wonderful things God has done everywhere else but in Tulsa. But I can promise you that there is encouraging things when I look through and I see how you guys do it and I see the Bible studies and, and I see the great eight and I see your guys' incredible summer nights and, and I just think to myself, you know, self, they're doing it. So get back on up and just continue doing it. Whatever it is, continue doing it in Jesus' name. I am glad to have my family. i uh, got a great family. love my wife. She knows that. She's the best thing. Besides Jesus, man couldn't ask for anything more. And then God gave me a little bit more and gave me three boys. And I'm so glad that they're able to be with me tonight. Amen. Appreciate, Nate. Appreciate you reaching out and taking care of me. Um, I won't tell him that I deleted all my text messages to clean my phone out. So I had absolutely no idea where we were staying. I'm eat, looking through my email. I'm, so you think I've got it, huh? <laughs> I'll tell you, you'll hear, you'll hear what I've got in just a second. But, but I appreciate you taking good care of us, and thank you for the basket. Thank you for the hospitality. Uh, Brother and Sister Gaddy, they are the only people I have, besides the Anthony family, that I have ever ridden in a jeepney with. They are in a u- unique class of their own. And uh, we have shared some great life experiences. He has counseled me and took time out of his schedule. And Sister Gaddy is a great friend to my wife. and uh, They've impacted me well beyond our time of interaction, I'll tell you that. And obviously pastor this great church. And then what they do across not only this state, which is very impacting, but as well as our organization throughout the kingdom. And that's well beyond the borders of this great nation. And I can tell you, they are impacting the world, and you have some great leaders at this great church. And I think it'd be appropriate if we just put our hands together for your pastor, his precious family, and the leadership of this church. Amen. I appreciate the church today, which is where God has allowed me to be able to um, serve for the last uh, nearly nine years now. And for them allowing me to be able to be here tonight, very humbled to serve such a great church. Amen. I'm going to take your attention to the book of Exodus, third chapter. Won't be long tonight. I realize I'm what is stopping us from a menu of corn dogs and a mouthful of watermelon seeds. So I won't be lengthy. I felt something in the Holy Ghost. And I felt it again when we got to the hotel and I was able to spend a couple minutes after 
the car ride over here in the business center there. And I felt like God just wanted me to talk about something pretty simplistic. Uh, Ten years ago, I wanted to wow you. But that's before I started pastoring. Now I just have a desire to tap into what God really wants for this church and those that are connected via friendships. Amen. There's something very vital that God wants us to talk about. And I realize the rich history of this church. And so if, if I'm able to do nothing more than refresh you on something within the Word of the Lord, then I can walk out of here feeling like I've done what God has sent me here to do. Amen. Praise God. Uh, Exodus chapter number 3. Moses is in a, he's in a pickle here. He's in a pickle because God is wanting to call him into a position in which he has spent the last 40 years running from. He's being called back into Egypt. And there's a discussion. And that discussion is, send somebody else. That's the ultimate end game of that discussion. If you could find somebody else, send that other individual. And God reveals something that I feel like is very powerful, and which I want to bring to your attention here for a couple moments tonight, found in the 19th verse. And I realize that you have probably uh, read this many of times, but let me bring it to your attention once more. God's talking about the wonders that He is going to do. And He says this, And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go No, not by a mighty hand. That that is, is not unless he is compelled by a mighty hand. So then he says, And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. It is going to take a mighty hand. Hand, so I will stretch out my hand. That's what he says. It's, it's, ne- it's a necessity that there be a mighty hand that moves against Egypt. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand. So if a mighty hand is necessary then I'll go ahead and take the position of stretching out the mightiest of them all. But then the continuation of that discussion is chapter number 4. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, What is in thine hand? It's going to take a mighty hand. What is in your hand? That's what he says. I'm going I'm to show Egypt the wonders that I'm able. I'm going to bring the... What is in your hand, Moses? Amen. So I want to talk about it just for a second tonight. About the miracle of rest. Will you allow me to talk to you? 20 minutes. The miracle of rest. Can we pray in Jesus' name? Heavenly Father, I thank You for this great church and the great opportunity. Every friend that is here tonight. Every saint that is here tonight. Every member of this congregation. You are wanting us to come into a position where we can find rest. And I'm praying in the name of Jesus that you'll give me clarity tonight just to tap into the vein. There is something that this church is on the move and it is in a position, Lord, you are are pouring it out not only to this community, but the example ship is to this entire state and beyond the borders of Arkansas bleeding into this organization and beyond. And I pray, Lord, while they do a mighty work that they can find a time of Selah, a pause, a moment moment of rest, God, in your spirit, and everybody said in Jesus' name, 
Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. It's going to take a mighty hand, Moses, so I'll stretch out my hand. It's interesting, Moses turns to the burning bush. And it's, it's out of an inquisitive nature that there's something unique about this bush. It's not the fact that it's necessarily burning. It's the fact that the bush in itself is not being consumed. And so Moses goes up there to see exactly what is going on. And at the approach, he hears the word of the Lord. And the Lord says to Moses, Moses, I want you to remove your shoes. And so Moses does. He removes the sandals. That removing of sandals is a very significant. No barrier between you and me, Moses. What I'm going to tell you and what I'm going to reveal to you, I don't need there to be any barriers. What do you mean barriers? It's just a thin layer of, uh, 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 of fabric or a thin layer that separated the, uh, the body of Moses, if you would, from the holy ground that the Lord required Moses to remove his shoes because he was standing in the midst of that. The barrier in itself is, Moses, those shoes represent where you have come from. Those shoes represent where you are now. And I want you to remove that because I'm getting ready to reveal something to you that is going to absolutely cause you to have to totally rely on the spirit of the leading of my direction. And I don't want you to, I don't don't want there to be anything that that would filter this process. I want it to absolutely have that, that utmost integrity, if you would. And so Moses does. He removes his shoes and he walks into the presence of the Lord, Brother Gaddy. And as he's in the presence of the Lord, uh, God begins to reveal the plan. Moses begins to fight against that plan. Why don't you use somebody else? I'll give you Aaron. I'm not a very good speaker. Probably not the truth. Most qualified individual to go to the task. But, But nonetheless, Moses is grasping at straws. Let me have an opportunity to pass the buck to somebody else. And so the Lord finally says, Moses, I'm going I'm to reveal to you something. This is not going to be easy. You're going to have to convince the people of God, and then you're going to have to convince the king. And in order for that to happen, you need to know what my, uh, what my present name will be called, and you need to know that I'm going to stretch out my hand against them. And so Moses has this revelation, and God says, Moses... Not only am I going to stretch out my hand, but I'm going to reveal to you the, the, uh, the direction in which you are going to be able to prove that you come in my name. Yes. Yes. It's interesting to me that, that God said, Moses, I want you to remove your shoes, but what you have in your hand, I'll allow you to bring it into my presence. Yeah. Right? right? Amen. I don't care about where you've been. I don't care even where you are. But, but what you're holding in your hand... Yeah. I allow you to bring that into my presence. What are you holding on to was the question. And my question tonight is, what is in your hand tonight? Simplistic question. What have you brought into the presence of the Lord? What are you, what is your fingers gripped around? What, what are you bringing into the presence of God out, out, of, out of habit, out, out of something that, that has a, a, a certain amount of, uh, uh, of usefulness outside of this scenario? Why don't you go ahead and bring it into my presence? And so he does. Moses, what is in your hand? And so Moses simply says it's a rod. It is a tool of correction. It is a tool of guidance. It's a tool of leading. Moses, I'm going to prove to you, and you know the story very well. Moses, I'm going to prove to you. I want you to take what you have in your hand, and I want you to lay it down in the presence of the Almighty. It's interesting to me that Moses lays that thing down in the presence of the Almighty. And when he lays that thing down in the presence of the Almighty, it scares him to death. It literally scares him. The Bible says he flees from that which he gripped so tightly a second before. He lays it down in the presence of God and supernaturally God transforms what was a a, a, a simple, useful tool into something that would go to prove that the mighty God was in the corner of the man named Moses. Amen. Amen. 
Moses, you, you don't need to, to bring where you've been. All I care about right now is what is in your hand. That, that's just interesting to me because the man that is known after the, after the man that chased the heart of God comes all the way to the scene where his daddy sends him, and as his daddy sends him into the scene, uh, he's supposed to deliver some goods and bring the news back. David arrives upon the command of Jesse, and, and, and David, as he is there, David is, is taking notice. He's taking notice. Something's, something's significant here. There's something pretty significant. What's going on? This is what's going on. Here's the scenario. I'll go fight him. So he appears finally before Saul, and Saul says, you're not able. And David says, I sure am. I can prove to you I am. I, I, I took care of a lion. I took care of the bear, and, and God was with me, and God delivered me, and so will he deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Right? What is mind-boggling to me is that David brought a knife to a gunfight. What are you gonna what are you gonna defeat him with? Uh, here, try this on. It doesn't work. I, I've never proved this. And so David pulls back, and the little bitty sling is hanging from his belt. Are you kidding me? What right does a man have to come to war with a sling in his belt? But there's something mighty about an individual that will release himself and that which he has in the presence of the Lord. Moses, listen to me. I'm going to show you that your hand is really my hand and your actions will be my actions. And what you think that you have to do alone, you're just mirroring me. It is nothing but a mirror image of what God is willing to do. David had that understanding when he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. Now, David had to swing it. David had to practice. David had to pick the five stones up. But he ultimately knew that I am not alone. I am mirroring a divine purpose in all of this. Moses, you have a divine purpose, but not only a divine purpose, you have a divine being that is allowing you to mirror what he is able to do. Every time, Moses, every time Moses lifted that rod or put it down or touched the water or began to call out in the presence of Pharaoh, it was nothing more than a mirror image of what God was willing to do. In essence, Moses had yoked himself with the Almighty. It's going to take a mighty hand. What's in your hand? It's going to take a mighty hand. What's in your hand? I just got a rod. That'll do. That'll do. Bring it on in. It'll be fine. We'll use that. David, what do you got? Here's a sword. I don't need it. What do you got? I got a sling. That'll do. We're thinking that we have to have something significant or something astounding. I'm going to tell you, by faith, and I've got to hurry here tonight, but by faith, by faith, uh, all we had was a 600 square foot building, Brother Gaddy. That's all we had. I'm looking in. I'm, I'm excited. Eight years ago, I don't have two nickels to rub together. I'm just like, what? This is going to work. And my wife walks up, and she's like, are you kidding? A woman of faith. Are you kidding? I said, babe, can you see the platform? Can't you see those 40 chairs that we may be able to fit in there? Can't you see this thing lined up with carpet? Can't you see this... These, this little altar area, it's about a, about a strip about three or four foot wide that we're going to be able to see people pray through to the Holy Ghost. A year and a half later, we had 54 shoved into that little building and we had people getting the... Listen! There is a divine plan! And if you can align yourself with a divine individual and you can mirror that, anything can happen! Anything can happen. 
Anything can happen. I didn't have, brother, brother Gaddy, we didn't have a lot of money. So I went to Walmart and I thought, I wonder how we can get a baptismal tank. $14.95, I had enough. I got myself a swimming pool. I brought it to the church. I blew that thing up. And on a Saturday morning, I baptized an individual from my job that has himself baptized 25 other individuals. It doesn't matter what you think you don't have. Bring it in the presence of God and lay it down. Lay that thing down. There is a miracle in mirroring God. You're not doing it alone, Moses. It's my hand. I'm just allowing you to stand in my stead. David, you're not doing it alone. And on and on the examples in the word of the Lord. You're not alone. There is a divine purpose. There is a divine purpose. There is a divine plan. There is divine process. And there is a being that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can ask or think. And I've got to quit trying to measure those giftings that I think I have or have not. If I could just come in, break open that alabaster box, pour that on the feet, and watch the fragrance fill the entire room. There's a miracle in rest. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, chapter number 11, He finishes this chapter with three verses that are very impacting to us, especially in times when we find ourselves spiritually or emotionally or physically or psychologically almost on empty. We hear these words and we read these words. He said this, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That rest signifies the completion of the process. You have been weary. You are heavy laden. You are doing it yourself. You feel like that you have the weight. You feel like that there's nobody else that could do this. Do you understand what I'm talking about? That the weight is on. That call to come to me, hear me now. That call to come, that's an invitation. That's him seeing somebody that is improperly Carrying something that only he should carry. It denotes not somebody that is walking freely, Brother Gaddy, but somebody that is yoked with a heavy burden, a laborious burden. And what he is saying is, what's in your hand? You're doing that without me. You're doing that on your own. It's not, let's have freedom from being yoked. No, that has nothing to do with the verse. It's, let's trade. Yes. Why don't you come over here and put on my yoke? Yes. Why are you walking around thinking that you have to do this? Come on, Moses, 40 years running? You knew you were a goodly child. You knew there was purpose. You were the one that got saved. You knew, Moses. You can't hide on the backside of the desert. God's going to say, hey, listen, the weight that you're carrying, the direction that you're going doesn't work for me. Come here. Let me show you something. You need to mirror me. You need to put on my yoke. You need to put on my will. You need to put on my direction. You need to put on my anointing. Quit trying to do this on your own, Moses. You can't carry this around. I felt it in the Holy Ghost again at that hotel that this church carries a major weight not only for this city but the impact goes well beyond and God was telling me to remind this great congregation there is a rest 
There is a rest for you. This call to come, it's too refreshing. But the purpose is not just rest. The invitation is to the yoke. The effects of the yoke is rest. Me. Take on me. Take on me. I don't know about you, but I'm not custom fit to the crown of thorns. Oh, I don't know what size he was, but my shoulders are not broad enough to wear the robe. My hands are not in such a manner that I could hold the same reed that he held. I am not called to hold some of those things that God is saying, give them to me and I will show you rest. But the rest that I can give is not just a rest that is a release. It is a rest of responsibility. It is not a rest from service. It is a rest to surrender. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. And it was like God was wanting me to tell you in the middle of your summer that God wants to give you rest, church. He wants to give you that rest. He wants to pour that out on this church so that you will be equipped to do exactly what you need to do. Heavy laden, emotional, depression. I'm telling you, I I feel it in the spirit right now. I'm speaking to somebody that has been carrying around some things. And God's saying, trade me, trade me, trade me, trade me. Bring it to me. Let me show you. Listen, if you're yoked with him, he's carrying the majority of the weight. I'm not tugging first. I'm being led. And that is ultimately what he desired. Because he said things like this. Learn of me. Mirror me. Mirror me. It was not about what labor could be accomplished. But with whom it was supposed to be accomplished with. That concept of weary and heavy laden, and I circle back to a close here, is a cause and effect principle. That heavy laden caused me to be weary. And so Jesus is trying to describe this Mighty, heavy load upon the back or the shoulders of an exhausted laborer. She had spent everything that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Exhausted. Because I can't do anymore. And we're not talking just about the process. It's talking about, listen, I come from an area, maybe it's isolated, but it seems like the attacks of the enemy, which are very real. He's very cunning, very intentional. Fear is on the rise. Discouragement is on the rise. Distraction is on the rise. It's just on the rise. Cluttered in the fray, this giant hairball that I keep telling our church that is, that is just sucking us all into. This has, it, it, there's a momentum to that where Jesus is trying to say, listen, I've got something very, very special and particular for my people, but I've got to get them yoked with me. Yeah. I've got to get them to mirror me. That concept of learn of me is literally a, a, a becoming of a disciple. Yeah. And that disciple is not just acquiring information. It's about transformation. So in essence, the call to come to him is really a call to become more like him. 
become more like me. Moses, lay it down. That's like me. Pick it up. That's like me. Moses, walk in there with your head high and tell them, let my people go. Mirror me, Moses. Yoke yourself with me. And I'm talking to a great church that God does not want wearied by distractions. He wants us to learn of Him to become more like Him. And He is the same God that spent six days forming and molding and speaking life into existence and then saying, I'm going to sanctify the seventh day. Rest is not a state of being. It is a miracle. Rest was just as miraculous as the formation of mankind, Brother Gaddy. All seven days were part of creation. And creating is miraculous. And God said, I'm going to create something that if man will become like me. The miracle of rest. Come like me. Peter said this. Musicians, you can come. Peter said this. He said, if it's really you, let me come to where you are. And he used the term, bid me to come. Let me come out there. In essence, he was saying, If it's really you, I want to do what you're doing. Because I want to be where you are. You know that term, follow me, is often translated into a term that we're very familiar with. It's the term road. So in essence, when Jesus is saying, follow me, he's saying, let's share the same road. Let's share the same road. But let's not just share the same road. Well, how do you know that? Because Luke chapter, I believe it's 9, maybe verse number 23 says something along the lines of, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The interesting fact that that verse says, if any man will come after me, if the desire of man is to come after me, that's the desire of man. I just want to, I want to come to where you are. But I want you, I don't want to make something out of nothing. But it almost appears that Jesus is trying to identify the fact that man desires to come after him. But God's desire is for us to follow him. If any man will come after me, he's got to deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. But the term come after me is not the same term, Brother Gaddy, as follow me. They're very separate terms. Come after me denotes a formation. Get in line. And the steps that I take, you you take. Come after me would be, I'm going right, so make sure you go right. Come after, if any man desires to to come after me. But Jesus says, I'll give you something even better than that. I'm paraphrasing. If he will deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, because that term follow me does not mean in formation. The term follow me means... Side by side, together. Awful lot like Matthew 11. If you want to follow me, you've got to yoke yourself with me. And then he specifically says the way to follow me is to pick up the cross daily. It would almost appear that the yoke that he wants us to to 
to put on is that cross. Deny yourself. We think of those terms in terms of sin, Brother Gaddy, but, and what we shouldn't do. But what about those things that we should do? Deny yourself from taking on that which you should not take on. Deny yourself from bitterness. Deny yourself from unforgiveness. Deny yourself. Don't hide those things in the chambers of your heart. Take your cross up. I've got mine. You've got yours. Let's go. The miracle of rest is that God wants us to be yoked with Him. And if I'm yoked with Him, I'm telling this great church, I will find a rest that is refreshing. It's not something I'm made to do. It's more like something He leads me. Is it that David had an understanding in the 23rd Psalm when he said it like this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The most amazing word in those six verses just spoke to me. Brother Gaddy, it just rocked me. I guess I'm so simple-minded that it just rocked me last Sunday when I looked into the pages of his word again and I saw it for the first time. It just popped in my head from the Spirit of God like God was trying to show me because the most important word in that verse up to Sunday morning had always been shepherd. That was the description of Psalms 23 to me. But it was like the Lord was saying, the most important word in this verse is not shepherd. It's Lord. Shepherd describes the Lord. But the Lord leads me. Almost as if David understood. Oh, we're going left. Beside still waters to those green pastures. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Where, Brother Gaddy? Behind? Pushing the flock? Oh, no. My sheep hear my voice and they follow. And if I'm wandering out there, wondering why that I feel this way, wondering why that I'm going through, wondering why, I don't, I'm not saying it's the answer, I'm just saying if you're in that state of wandering and you're wondering why, Maybe it's because I'm just outside of the earshot of the Lord that is serving me as a shepherd. Come to me! I wonder why I'm dealing with this. Come to me! That's the cry for tonight. Come to me. Come to me. There is a miracle in rest. Can we just close our eyes for just a moment? I don't know how you end your summer nights, but I feel the power and the presence of the Almighty. There is a rest and a refreshing in this house. A rest in your marriage. There is a rest in your relationship. There is a rest in your job. There is a rest in your relationship with your kids. There is a rest in your church work. There is a rest. Come to me is the cry of tonight. I don't know if you wouldn't stand with me. Rarely do I do I do this, but Brother Gaddy, I feel it in the Holy Ghost. I feel like you know where to go from this point. You know what you need to do from this point. I wouldn't. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. What he was saying is mimic me 
but understand I'm mimicking Him. I'm following Him. We're sharing the same road. What do you mean? How do you know they share the same road? It happened on Damascus, I'm telling you. They shared the same road at the same time. And when they did, there was a revelation that happened in the life of Saul that transformed a, a sinner into a man that was going to give his life the same road at the same time. And that same God is saying, I wish somebody would give me an opportunity right now. Would you raise your hands to the Almighty? Brother Gaddy comes. In the name. I think the Spirit is calling us to step out right now. If you're feeling a witness in your spirit right now, needing that rest, I want you to step out. If you're just feeling a witness to respond to God's prodding and God's word tonight, I want you to come from all over this sanctuary right now. We're not going to choreograph anything, but if you feel like it, if you need to lift those hands to the Lord and say, Lord, pour that rest into my spirit right now. I've been hanging on to this for too long. I've been trying to work through it on my own for too long. I want to mirror you, Lord. I want to mirror your way, your will, your pattern, your way, oh Lord. Come on, that's it. Lift up.